afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This is William Bell with All Things Fulfilled, and with me is... Uh, Daniel Rogers with LaborNotInVain.com. All right, and we're here today to um, do a presentation. We've been reviewing the Southwest Lectures, and we're going to do a particular review today, but we're going to title it Roundabout Eschatology. Now, what do we mean by roundabout eschatology? Well, if you looked at today's modern engineering projects, and I don't know how modern they are, they may just be upgraded from what used to be, but where they have what's called a roundabout, and as you go in the roundabout, it heads off in several different directions. So you can go to the east, the west, the north, or the south, or any places in between, depending on where those streets are. This explains what we're experiencing with what we're hearing in the Southwest Power Lectures, as well as the information and documentation that we read from our brothers, Daniel, on matters that pertain to the end time. And that kind of leads us to this roundabout where we don't know which street to turn off on because everybody is saying something different. That's right. And not only that, but even uh, the audience members at the South Haven Power Lectureship um, they must be confused as well. They hear one speaker stand up and say, this passage refers to this, and the very next speech, they hear another man of equal reputation stand up and say, ah, oh, this passage actually refers uh, to this over here. And so we're going to explain some of the contradictions among the brethren at the South, um, the South Haven Power Lectureship and hope to show you uh, this crazy roundabout eschatology that exists within the Churches of Christ. All right. Well, let me pull up my tie so I'll look presentable. I don't know whether it was up or not. At any rate, uh, the first speech that we're going to talk about uh, today is a speech that was delivered by Keith Mosier on uh, Daniel chapter 9, uh, verses 24 through 27 particularly. And we're going to look at a particular subject of seal up vision and prophecy. But in looking at Daniel 9, 24 through 27, uh, one of the things that was noticed in uh, Keith Mosher's speech, that is Keith Mosher Sr., uh, in his speech was that uh, he didn't have very much to say about the latter verses of Daniel 9 and indicated that those verses, uh, for the most part, were fulfilled in the first week or in the... Um, uh, the first, the, the last prophetic week of Christ, that is in the 70th week. So let me read a quote from you, and then we can specify a little bit more. Did you have anything, Daniel, that you wanted to? Not quite. Okay. Just getting ready. All right. So uh, the terminus of Daniel 9.24 reads as follows. And to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy, within the period of 490 years, when Messiah came, the visions and prophecies of the Old Testament concerning the Messiah, the Redeemer, would be fulfilled. That is, they would no longer be open and awaiting fulfillment. Now, he's quoting Rex Turner uh, on that, page 320. But, as he admits, he's a student of Rex Turner. And, by the way, that's rather interesting. Let me just tell you a little bit about that. When I was in the School of Preaching, at the Memphis School of Preaching, uh, our textbook on the Holy Spirit was Frank by J. Franklin Camp. And J. Franklin Camp, as we will see a little bit later, uh, took the position that the events were fulfilled in 70 AD as it related to the mir miracles, as it related to sealing up vision and prophecy. However, uh, Rex Turner has a different view. So from one period of time, the school of preaching, which was considered to be sound, teaching sound doctrine, held a position that is totally different from the current position that is being advocated by Keith Mosher with regard to uh, the fulfillment of Daniel 70 weeks. That's right. Uh, even varying in the position of whether or not there is some non-miraculous literal indwelling of the, of the Spirit. Okay. Or, uh, you know, if, if the indwelling of the Spirit in Scripture is talking about a miraculous indwelling. Oh. And so with the change of, uh, of directors and professors, there came a huge change in a pretty important topic. Absolutely, absolutely. Now, let me continue on with this quote. He said, Merit added, the word seal carries a meaning of assurance, guarantee, or authenticity of that which has been set forth. In this case, it gives proof by coming to pass. And that is uh, on page 186. And of course, um, this is something that we want to look at because he says, the proof is in the coming to pass of these events. 
Now, let's go on with another quote. This is on Daniel 9 and verse 27. Um, he then said, after stating that this is the middle of the week when these things are fulfilled, and then uh, within that last week uh, at the time of the uh, fulfillment of the gospel to the Gentiles, which you will see here, uh, he also is stating that some of this refers to 70 A.D. Daniel, I'm not quite sure how that works. Well, it's interesting. He, he states that the end of the 70 weeks is here at the Gentiles, but then he says on the next slide we're about to look at that the terminus, um, or rather the latter portion of Daniel chapter 9, ends in AD 70. Okay. And so we're on this roundabout, and we have one road that leads to the AD 33 doctrine and another road that leads to the AD 70 doctrine. Uh, absolutely. And we, we don't know which road <laughs> to take. We don't know which way, road to take. But more importantly... The people in the audience don't know what road to take. Absolutely. They're Absolutely. hearing things not only from different speakers, but from the same speakers that, contradi that are contradictory and different uh, and quite confusing. And yet we have a leadership saying everybody is teaching sound doctrine. These are great lessons. Uh, so let's notice. Jesus' ministry was just three and one half years or the middle of the week. And when he died on that cruel cross, he entered the ancient animal sacrifices and oblations. And he cites Daniel 9, 27, Hebrews 10, 1 through 4, and Romans 7, 4 through 7. But the covenant with the Jews under the Mosaic dispensation did mean that they would hear the Christ first, Matthew 10, 5. And then the Jews also heard the gospel first after Jesus' death and the beginning of the church of Christ, Acts 2, 5 forward. When the one week of Daniel's prophecy would be over, the Gentiles would hear the gospel message. Now, William, that's kind of confusing because it seems like he's saying that the old covenant ended at the cross. And yet somehow, some way, the old covenant, even though it was nailed to the cross, is still providing some special blessing to the Jews that they can hear the gospel first? Absolutely. William, what's what's That's rather interesting, here? especially when they're saying... Everything, as far as Israel was concerned, ended at the cross, uh, that there was no more uh, hope for Israel, you know, after the cross. And yet at the same time, here's the gospel going to Israel first, and then also, of course, coming to the Gentiles as well. So that is interesting. And, and another thing I found interesting about this is he says that all prophecy concerning Messiah the Redeemer would be fulfilled. But if you think about that interesting phrase, the Redeemer... What does that carry with it? Does Romans chapter 8 not predict the redemption of the body? And who would bring about that redemption but Christ? Absolutely. And Paul even says in Romans 9, 3 and following, that that promise of the redemption of the body, the adoption of sons, belongs to Israel after the flesh. Friends, this is, where do we turn? To whom do we go? Absolutely. Uh, right now, I can't figure it out if I'm going to be following what I'm hearing here. All right. Now, that was on page 251. And uh, so let's go on. Uh, Keith Mosher also stated, it is definitely the case. Now, we just read a slide where he said these things would happen in AD 33, right? That's right. And uh, now he says, it is definitely the case that Daniel's prophecy ended in a reference to the abomination that makes for desolation. And that Jesus said that when one would see such a reference to, one would see such, a reference to the Roman army surrounding Jerusalem in AD 70, one should flee, uh, Daniel 9, 27, Matthew 24, and 15. So it seems that Brother Mosher has a problem with consistency. Does the 70 weeks end in AD 30 or AD 33, or does it end in AD 70? Now, another speaker on the lectureship, uh, Brother Drew Leonard, he holds a completely different position. He's just trying to be consistent with the text, and notice what he says. This is on page 231 of his book, The Night Visions. And by the way, all the quotes that we're pulling from can be found in the South Haven uh, Church of Christ lectureship book entitled The End of Time that can be purchased from their website. Drew Leonard says, Now before I go any further, I do want you to know that I find the end of the 70 weeks at the year of A.D. 70 when the city of Jerusalem and the temple of the Jews was destroyed. With that said, you know now I look for a fulfillment of those six things before or in A.D. 70. Now, Moser says, no way. The 70 weeks ended by the time of the Gentiles that, that, that they were preached to. And yet another speaker on the lectureship takes a completely different view and says these things, cont they continue to A.D. 70. Now, it seems to me 
giving what, uh, given what we just read by Brother Moser concerning the, uh, the abomination of desolation, it seems that Brother Leonard has a more consistent view of this text. Doesn't it seem like that to you? It, it does. It does. And here's something else I noted. Uh, if the gospel ended, or if, if those 70 weeks ended with the gospel being preached to the Gentiles, which would be the end of that week, that's prior to 70 AD as he stated. I notice that he has Matthew 24 and verse 15 here, um, which, as you said, talked about the abomination of desolation that goes beyond that. But what's interesting is that verse is in the context of verse 14, which says this gospel of the kingdom must be preached as a witness to all the nations, then the end would come. Daniel, did the end come when the gospel first went to the Gentiles? No, it did not. The temple continued to stand for many, many more years. So much and so, in fact, as we're about to see a little bit later, there was confusion about, should we keep the law? Should we bind the law on the Gentiles? What should we do, brethren? And that's, that's a question we'll talk about later. All right. And to further go on with the quote, Jackson added that Josephus, the Jewish historian, stated that Daniel also wrote concerning the Roman government and that our country should be made desolate by them. Christian Courier 6 from Antiquities of the Jews, uh, Book 10, Chapter 11, and uh, paragraph 7. So what we have here is even a quote from uh, Wayne Jackson stating that Josephus said that Daniel spoke about the destruction of Jerusalem, that Rome would come and destroy Jerusalem from Daniel chapter 9. And yet both of those brethren somehow have Jerusalem as the fall of Jerusalem as the end, as the, as the total goal of that chapter, chapter 9 of Daniel. And yet they want to end the 70 weeks, which is the main thrust of the chapter, uh, 40 years before that. Right. Now, we understand that Daniel's, uh, Daniel 9 and the 70 weeks is a, a rather complicated prophecy and gives people challenges. But let's look at what Franklin Camp said, who also, you know, did some writing on this particular subject. On uh, Daniel 9, 20 through 27, he said the following. The Old Testament points to the destruction of Jerusalem. So it seems like he's agreeing with Drew Leonard. Yeah. All right. Or Drew Leonard is agreeing with him because Camp wrote first, right? <laughs> and then it says, and it is referred to in several of the prophets, Zechariah 14, Malachi chapters 3 and 4, as well as Joel and Daniel. And remember, we spoke about Malachi 3 and 4 when we uh, were talking about Keith Ritchie. But anyway, he says, whatever may be the difficulty in figuring the 70 weeks in relation to the fall of Jerusalem, now, Kemp is saying whatever is that difficulty in figuring those 70 weeks according to the destruction of Jerusalem or relating to that, there cannot be any doubt that it is included. Christ settles this, and he cites Matthew 24, same text that, Wayne, uh, excuse me, that Keith Mosher uh, cited. Uh, Matthew 24 is a prophecy concerning the fall of Jerusalem. In the midst of the prophecy, Christ said, when ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken by, uh, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. So they both cite the same text. Right. Then he says, Jesus identifies the prophecy of Daniel so as to include the fall of Jerusalem. Luke 21, verse 20, makes it clear that the reference is to the Roman army. If we can accept the words of Christ, Daniel, by inspiration, saw Jerusalem fall. Now, it seems like Keith Mosier and Wayne Jackson and brethren that agree with that position have the fall of Jerusalem as sort of a, just a secondary side point in Daniel chapter 9. When men like Franklin Kemp and uh, Drew Leonard take what Daniel says and take what Jesus says and try to be consistent and see the fall of Jerusalem as the ending of the 70 weeks. Absolutely. And by the way, that quote was from Franklin Kemp, Work of the Holy Spirit in Redemption, page 46. Now, I don't know about you, William. But if a man is trying his best to line up with what Jesus said concerning the end of the 70 weeks and the fulfillment of those prophecies, well, I want to be more like that individual than the ones who sort of just treat it as a side uh, subject. Absolutely. I, I agree. Now, here's something else that Camp says, and he sort of outlines uh, the various points in Daniel 9, 20 through 27. So he makes some subpoints under that. He says, all Bible students admit that this passage is a difficult one. But in spite of the difficulties, there are some things that are evident. Number one, it is a prophecy of the Messiah that was to come. Number two, the Messiah would come to Jerusalem. Number three, the Messiah would be cut off, that is, die, 
Number four, his death would be to atone for sins. That is to make an end of sin and make reconciliation for iniquity. And number five, he would bring in an everlasting righteousness, which is the forgiveness of sins. It is resurrection. And um, it would also, uh, and he cites Acts 3. Uh, no, he doesn't cite that. That's a text that I want to bring in and talk about when we talk about uh, the uh, forgiveness of sins and, and reconciliation and, and bringing in of righteousness. But go ahead. You have something uh, uh, from Drew Leonard on this particular point. Yes, uh, Drew Leonard goes in his book on the night visions, and he details the meaning of uh, the various uh, blessings associated with the 70 weeks. Now, we have disagreements on the exact nature um, of these blessings, but we agree with them that they end in 8070. Okay. Now, go ahead. I was going to uh, read one little part here about the subject of, um, of the sealing up of vision and prophecy that fits with what is what's being said here by uh, Brother Kemp in the theme of his book, The Work of the Holy Spirit in Redemption. Drew Leonard says on page 233, uh, What about sealing up vision and prophecy? In my opinion, this means that miraculous gifts, vision and prophecy, standing as euphemisms for the entire miraculous office, would cease in A.D. 70. If all Daniel's 70 weeks prophecy was to receive fulfillment by or in A.D. 70, then what else are we to make of this phrase? Now, uh, in the lexicon by Agassinius, he goes into more detail about what seal up vision and prophecy means. And he uh, suggests that it has to do, as Brother Mosher suggested, with the fulfilling uh, and sealing it by fulfillment, um, those particular prophecies. Now that being said, uh, listen to what Brother Bell has to say about Acts 3, 21 to 26, and all the prophecies made by Moses and Samuel and all the other worthy prophets of the Old Testament. And by the way, they were prophesying, as Brother Mosier would put it, concerning the Messiah, the Redeemer. Absolutely. Now, it's very interesting that uh, they cited Luke chapter 21 and stated that that was the time of the Roman army or the invasion in Jerusalem in 70 AD. Well, in Acts chapter 3, uh, Peter quotes from, or references, quotes from all the Old Testament prophets. And uh, so he said, concerning the coming of the Lord, in verse 20 of chapter 3, he says, And that he may send Jesus, who was preached to you before, whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets, since the age began. Now, the text here has world. But when you look that word up in the original, it is the word age, all right, the word eon. But he says, for Moses, and he starts with Moses, saying, for Moses truly said to the fathers, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. Him shall you hear in all things whatever he says to you. And it shall be that every soul who will not hear that prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. Now, the people here are the Jews. That's right. This is a reference to the destruction of Jerusalem. I see you got something to say, Daniel. Go ahead. They are the people who Brother Mosher said would be preached to first. They would be the first ones to hear the word of God. And watch, and that will be confirmed right here again. Because he says, And it shall be that every soul who will not hear that prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. Yes, and all the prophets from Samuel and those who follow, as many as have spoken, have also foretold these days. You are the sons of the covenant, or so, uh, you are the sons of the prophets, and of the covenant which God made with our father, uh, father, saying to Abraham, and in your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now watch what that promise of Abraham is in this text. To you first, well that's what you said a moment ago, to the people first, to the Jewish nation first, to you first, God, having raised up his servant Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from your iniquities. And so we can see the promise of Abraham was the turning away of Israel from their iniquities. And all of those who would not turn, he said, would be destroyed from among the people. That's right. Now, consider this. Um, uh, Brother William is about to bring up a point from Romans 11, 25 to 26. And I want to read a comment from Drew Leonard about that section of Scripture as well here momentarily. But notice what Peter just got done preaching. Uh, those who disagree with 
uh, the fact that Jesus is Messiah and reject his words will be utterly destroyed from among the people. But those who listen to the words and accept it will be able to take part in the blessings of Abraham brought about through the risen seed, Jesus Christ. Now notice how the Sadducees react to this message. As they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to them, being greatly disturbed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection out from among the dead ones. The teaching of the resurrection out from among the dead ones has to do with turning the iniquity from Jacob, restoring Israel, and casting off uh, the wicked of Israel, cutting them off from the people. And Brother Bell's going to uh, confirm that to us from Romans 11, 15, as well as Romans 11, 25, and 26. All right, so let's take a look at those passages very quickly. He says, For if there being cast away is the reconciling of the world, and he's talking about Israel. If their being cast away is the reconciling of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? That's resurrection. And one other point I want to just back up and state, and that is Romans chapter 11 and verse 7, he says, what then? Israel has not obtained what it seeks, but the elect have obtained it. Now he's talking about resurrection from the dead and he says they're already obtaining it, but he says the rest were blinded. So we're still talking about turning them away from their iniquities as Daniel indicated and as uh, Acts 3 and 4 indicates. But notice in Romans 11, 25 and 26, for I do not desire brethren that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion, that blindness in part, you see, he said the rest were blinded, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. And so all Israel will be saved. I thought that was already completed and that God was finished with them at the cross. That's what it sounded like. And by the way, didn't Paul say in Acts 28, 15 that he uh, preached the hope of Israel? Well, I thought the hope of Israel was fulfilled at the end of the 70 weeks. Well, I don't think that could... Well, at, at the hope of Israel is fulfilled at the end of the 70 weeks. Well, I know, but didn't Brother Moser say that that was in eighty thirty? Well, he did. So was Paul confused about the fulfillment of that uh, word? Somebody is confused. I'm not really sure that it's Paul, though. Now, we had a quote um, by Brother Flavel Nichols that indicated that the 70 weeks was about God's eternal scheme of redemption. Let me get that quote uh, from Flavel Nichols. He says, the 70 weeks would bring to a completion the development of the scheme of redemption. Likely, the anointing of the Holy of Holies refers to the establishment of the church. Now, brethren, if you take all three of these positions, that uh, you take the position of Brother Mosher, that uh, the sealing up vision and prophecy has to do with the uh, fulfillment of the prophecies concerning the Messiah. You take Drew Leonard's position, and I said three, but we're going to take four. You take Drew Leonard's position, that that also indicates the completion of the miraculous. You take Brother Camp's position, which says that regardless of what you want to, where you want to start the 70 weeks, they have to end at AD 70. And you take uh, Brother Flavel Nichols' position, which says that the 70 weeks talks about the entire uh, scheme of redemption uh, that God had planned before the foundation of the earth. You take all four of those positions, and you know what you have? Covenant eschatology. Absolutely. And, you know, by the way, let's go back to this Romans, uh, because remember the text in Acts, which started saying that he would send Jesus, whom the heaven must receive till the restoration of all things spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the age began? Well, notice Romans 11, uh, 26. And so all Israel will be saved, as it is written, the deliverer will come out of Zion, and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant to them when I take away their sins. This passage was speaking of a future from the time of uh, the coming in of the Gentiles. Now how could that be? Daniel 9 said that the making of end of sins would be at the end of the 70 weeks, which Brother Mosher said was 80-30. There must be a problem here, and it's not with Paul, that's a for sure. Absolutely. Now, however, we do have a solution by our good friend and brother in Christ, Drew Leonard. Notice what he says about uh, Daniel 12, verse 2, in connection with Romans 11, 25, and 26. Speaking of Ezekiel 37, he says on page 302 of his commentary on Daniel, they had been spiritually separated or dead, but God was going to take them back to the land 
uh, revive or resurrect them. In Daniel 12, 2, we had the same kind of situation. The Jews were dead spiritually, so they needed a resurrection, and it would come in A.D. 70. Now the question is, and he goes on and he talks about a progressive resurrection. Those who are resurrected at Pentecost, those who are resurrected through the preaching of the gospel, and then those who would be finally resurrected in A.D. 70. Here's what he says about Romans 11. In Romans 11, we see the Jews as these branches of this tree, and these branches were cut off of the tree because of their unbelief. The Jews that were of unbelief were dead spiritually, not physically, to God. They needed resurrection out of this unbelieving dead state. This is why Paul said in Romans 11:15, what Brother Bell quoted from us a while ago, that the reconciliation of the Jews would be life from the dead. And Brother, Brother Leonard says, did you catch that last phrase? <laughs> indicating that there would be resurrection. They would be made alive again at the, end of the se at the end of the 70 weeks at the fall of Jerusalem in AD 70, fulfilling Daniel 12 and verse 2. And uh, Brother Leonard goes on to, to say very eloquently and prove very eloquently how Romans 11, 25, and 26 was fill fulfilled in AD 70 as well. Well, Daniel, if, uh, if I read, heard you correctly as you read that, you're saying to me and to the audience that Drew Leonard has written in his book, and what's the page number? This is page uh, 302. Page 302, that the resurrection of Israel would be consummated in 70 A.D. Is that basically what he's saying? He says they needed a resurrection, and it would come in A.D. 70. Wow. Page 302. Okay, but now, as I understood it, he was praised for doing a fantastic job in teaching his lesson. Is that correct? That's right. But when we say that, we're considered as heretics. What's up with that? Well, it's, it's some, uh, well, what do you call it? The, uh, the dichotomy of autonomy. <laughs> <laughs> we're autonomous when it comes to uh, particular views. We don't see as fellowship issues. But when it comes to a fellowship issue, boy, their autonomy goes away. And everybody disfellowships the one they disagree with. Absolutely. And there's a very inconsistent form of uh, this fellowship within the churches of Christ. We'll talk about that later, though. Let's All right, well, let's uh, shift and talk a little bit about, do you believe in miracles? Okay. <laughs> All right, so do you believe in miracles? And um, this, uh, some additional quotes from J. Franklin Kemp, but I want to get this before us. Uh, here's a quote on page 307 from the work of the Holy Spirit in Redemption. He says, fulfilled prophecy confirms the word of the prophet. It shows up the counterfeit claims of liars, diviners, and wise men, Isaiah 44, 25. And he cites other passages from the Old Testament in Isaiah uh, 44 and 45 as well, and uh, possibly 46 as well. But he says these passages establish the vital nature of prophecy in the revelation of the will of God and mark it with credibility. Because prophecy is a word miracle. Unlike miracles of healing, fulfilled prophecy stands as an argument of inspiration for every generation. It has no need for being repeated. The fulfilled events stand as a witness to the inspiration of the prophet and mark the Bible as God's book. That to me is saying that without fulfillment, inspiration cannot be fully confirmed. That's right. And he proved that as we'll notice later if we have the time. We might be pressed for it. But he gave several reasons why the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70 was important in his book, The Work of the Holy Spirit and Redemption. And one of those reasons was the fall of Jerusalem was the final proof, the final seal that the Holy Word of God is inspired. All right. Well, I want to continue on. He says, um, it has no need for being repeated. The fulfilled events stand as a witness to the inspiration of the prophet." And mark the Bible as God's book. One should not be surprised that prophecy became the base of all miraculous operations of the Spirit. The fulfilled event had within it the seeds of its own confirmation apart from any other miracle. That's why fulfillment of the Word of God is a very, very important thing. All right, now, so when we talk about fulfillment... Uh, we also want to look at some other things that, that Camp stated. He says, here are six things that are clear, both in prophecy and in their fulfillment in the New Testament. Christ of the New Testament is the promised Messiah, Malachi, uh, Matthew 1. Uh, 
Number two, he says he came to Jerusalem. Number three, the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John established this. Number three, he was cut off or crucified, Acts 2.23. Number four, his death atoned for sins, Romans 5, 9 through 11. Number five, his atonement for sin, uh, his resurrection, and his ascension back to the right hand of God brought in everlasting righteousness. Now, he cites Romans 3, 24 through 26. And it sounds like uh, he's at least in this case, placing the fulfillment of righteousness in the uh, ministry of Christ or in the ministry of the apostles, the apostolic ministry, prior to 70 AD. Does that sound like what's happening in this particular text? That's what it seems like to me. Okay. But the Bible says we only have one hope. So we cannot have a hope that's fulfilled at one time and then fulfilled at a different time and claim that it's just one hope. Do you, do you follow what I'm saying? Well, I, I heard that very thing in a lecture today, but we'll talk about that in another video. Okay. All right. Now, here's what's important about the one hope. And I want to, let's just go to Galatians and, uh, and read this. The, the text says, Galatians 5 and verse 5, For we through the Spirit, Daniel, eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. Now, if there's only one hope, and, you know, we've heard that if we have hope fulfilled, it destroys everything. But here is a hope of righteousness. We only have one hope. So is this hope fulfilled? But now this is a hope that was through the Spirit. Now, when you say it's through the Spirit, what are we talking about here? Are we talking about a non-miraculous indwelling or are we talking about an indwelling of the Spirit? Well, what about uh, a statement by Stephen Wiggins? Let me, um, let me just at least cite that, and, uh, and we'll come back to that. But uh, in talking about this hope, we'll, we'll, come, we'll go to Stephen Wiggins' uh, passage in a moment. I mean, his quote in a moment. But uh, you've got several passages that talk about righteousness coming in. For example, you have 2 Peter 3, where Peter says, Nevertheless, we look for new heavens and new earth, wherein, what? righteousness dwells and then you have revelation 19 7 and 8 which talks about the marriage of the lamb has come and the bride has made herself ready and she has been clothed with uh, fine linen for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints but that comes after mystery babylon has fallen which is the great city that was spiritually called sodom and egypt where our lord was crucified that's a reference to jerusalem so at jerusalem's fall the time of the wedding has occurred. Now, Daniel, uh, how many times does Jesus get married in the scriptures? Well, he has one wife. That's okay. the bride of Christ. Okay. Right? The that's church, right. the bride of Christ, right? Uh, yeah, that's right. Every time we see the fall of the city in the New Testament, we have the wedding. Matthew 22, verses 1 through 7. Matthew 24, you have the destruction of the city. That is followed by the wedding in Matthew 25, 1 through 10. When you look at Revelation 19, as we just quoted, uh, God has judged the great harlot, Re uh, Revelation 19, 1 and 2, and then following that comes the salvation and the bride of Christ, and then again in Revelation chapter 21, the old heaven and earth passes away, and here comes the bride, <laughs> here comes the bride, and um, so in every one of those cases, are those different? They can't be different brides, they have to be what? Well, they have to be the church. They have to be the church. They have to be the same bride, and that's just simply the consummation. Well, but all of this is taking place through the Spirit, for we, through the Spirit, eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. Now, let's talk about that, but go ahead. you got something on well, your mind. it kind of confuses me, William, when I listen to these uh, different guys guiding me on these different streets on this roundabout. Uh, when you look at Daniel 70 weeks, Daniel 70 weeks posits the uh, entering in of everlasting righteousness no later than the end of that 70th week. Now, if that was the cross, well, the gifts of the Holy Spirit weren't sent until after the cross. So how could the Spirit prepare them for a, or bring, have the hope of righteousness that was through the Spirit if the everlasting righteousness had already come about? I mean, if it's everlasting righteousness, once it comes, it never goes away. So what did it come, and then it went away while they got the Spirit, and they're going to receive it again one day? Is this the righteousness righteousness that we that, talked about? <laughs> that's going to make two hope hopes, right? <laughs> it's going to really confuse things. Can you see why we're having a little bit of concern uh, trying to figure out which of these streets we get off on? Where are we going to turn? To the right, to the left, to the north, to the south, to the east, to the west? Because we have all of these 
uh, different quotes coming from these brethren. And so, Lord, to whom shall we go? As Daniel said, everlasting righteousness came in 70 A.D., just as Daniel 9, 27 states, just as some of these men have stated. And uh, yet that was through the work of the Spirit. Now, we have a very, very interesting quote. But go ahead. You may have a comment that you want to bring in at this point. Well, I was also going just to reinforce the fact that Second Peter 3 is a new, in, a new heavens and new earth wherein righteousness dwells. We have some very exciting things to tell you about that passage here in a little bit. But if that's where righteousness dwells, well, how is that different from the everlasting righteousness? If I already have everlasting righteousness at the cross, why do I need a brand new world where righteousness dwells? In fact, as we're going to notice later, Many people within the Church of Christ teach that Isaiah 65, that new heavens and new earth, started at the cross. Well, if that's where righteousness dwells, if that's where the everlasting righteousness comes in, how many heavens and earth of everlasting righteousness do we need before we, before we obtain our hope? Again, back to how many hopes do we have? Bouncing from world to world. Absolutely. Uh, now, here's a quote from Stephen Wiggins, whom I debated back in 1994, November of 1994. And uh, Stephen Wiggins had a paper along with Bill Lockwood. This paper was titled uh, Hammer and Tongues. And they took the position that every prophecy in the, uh, or every scripture in the New Testament that related to the Holy Spirit had Joel 2 as its background and therefore indicated that it was miraculous. So here's a quote from him. He said, for one to snatch the passage out of its first century context and slap a 20th century interpretation to it, is about praying for some imaginary, non-miraculous reception of the Spirit, and that is to do vile injustice to the meaning of the verse. Stephen Wiggins, Hammer and Tongues, page 3, 1992. Wow, William, that's, that's a pretty incredible quote. So what's going on here, if you're saying that we through the Spirit eagerly wait, for the hope of righteousness, and that righteousness is in the new heavens and the new earth. And that spirit is a miraculous spirit. Then to snatch and slap it out of the first century is to do vile injustice to the text. And we agree. And we certainly do. As a matter of fact, that became one of the very uh, just uncomfortable points for Stephen Wiggins during that debate because he had to face himself in that, indicating that uh, his own position refuted his eschatology. It shows the interconnection between and the interconnectivity uh, between pneumatology and eschatology. You cannot separate them. If your pneumatology is wrong, your eschatology is going to be incorrect. If your eschatology is incorrect, your pneumatology is going to be correct because they're hand in hand. Now, what did Franklin Camp has, have to say about that? In uh, Daniel uh, chapters 2, 7, and 9, he says, We have the prophecy of the establishment of the church uh, or of the kingdom or the church, Daniel sees the end of Judaism as well as the beginning of the spiritual kingdom which would have its beginning on the first Pentecost after the resurrection of Christ. By inspiration, Daniel saw the tremendous struggle that would go on between Judaism and its attempt to destroy the church. It is for this reason that Daniel saw not only the setting up of the kingdom that would uh, not ever be destroyed, but he also saw the fall of Jerusalem, uh, uh, saw the fall of Judaism when Jerusalem fell in 70 AD. So that's page 47 of his book and again he sees in Daniel 9 the connection of all of these events. In fact he goes on to say in his book uh, some very important comments about the significance of AD 70. Um, now one thing that we need to point out is that in the Preston Hester debate Dr. David Hester got up and basically mocked Don for holding the position that the a uh, universal flood, as Dr. Hester worded it, was a fulfillment, as he said, or a, rather as a type of the localized destruction of Jerusalem. And he was sure to stress those words, universal and localized. And Don stood up again and he said, the, the geographical effect of an event does not have any bearing on its spiritual meaning. And the key point that he brought up was the cross of Christ. The cross of Christ was a lot smaller of a geographical uh, event than the fall of Jerusalem. In fact, the fall of Jerusalem affected the entire uh, known world at the time. And we can talk about that on another day. But here's what Franklin Kemp says on page 47 of the work of the Holy Spirit in redemption. All right. He said, uh, Jesus indicates that neither the judgment of the flood nor the Babylonian captivity were equal to the fall of Jerusalem. Why the importance of this event? 
it was because of its relationship to some important Bible questions. Franklin Camp, Work of the Holy Spirit, page 47. Uh, this relationship between the fall of Jerusalem and other events in the Bible is why the event is important. It's not because of where it occurred. I mean, think about it. Christ was crucified, as you mentioned a moment ago, outside of the city, right? Outside of the gates. And yet, the importance of it has nothing to do with when it occurred in, in terms of the impact that it has for all after that event has occurred. Nor is it limited to the geographical location of where that event occurred. You see, if that argument, uh, that's what I call location limits application. And it's not true. As a matter of fact, all the miracles in the Bible have a universal application to them because if we deny one of them, we may as well deny all of the scriptures. That's right. Um, well, William, you said something that triggered a thought in my mind, but as that often does, it slipped right away. Well, so maybe it'll come back. <laughs> maybe it'll come back. And, and while we're on, on the way to looking at the significance of the destruction of Jerusalem, uh, here's another, I want to read this again. Uh, the prophecy of the fall of Jerusalem was just such a word miracle. When the event happened, as given in detail by Christ, it had the same tangible evidence of the miraculous as any miracle performed by Christ. Since a prophecy is a word miracle, it can be a miraculous confirmation for all ages and time. See, when, when people start telling us because things are fulfilled, they have no more application, well, Camp says that's not true. He says it becomes confirmation for all time. And Jesus even stated the same in John chapter 20 when he said, Truly many other signs did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, or John wrote. And he says, But these are written that you may believe, and that believing you may have life through his name. So we can read a written miracle, and that written miracle can produce the faith that is necessary for salvation. And Kemp says that that confirmation is good for all generations. Now, did you, did you remember what you said yet? Nope, not at all. <laughs> all right. Well, then let's get into uh, some of the points that Kemp made concerning the uh, significance of the fall of Jerusalem. And he gives maybe 10 or 12 of them, and they're all, uh, most of them are absolutely uh, incredible, and uh, they are some that I agree with. Number one, he says the, uh, the importance uh, of these questions answered by the fall of Jerusalem, he says it answers the question of what think ye of Christ. In other words, we cannot have a full understanding, appreciation, um, uh, establish the authenticity and the, um, the sonship of Christ, or at least the, uh, the divinity of Christ, etc., without fulfilling this prophecy of the destruction of Jerusalem. And so you ask a person, how important is the divinity of Christ? As a matter of fact, I've got books that demonstrate that Muslims, atheists, even Christians, as well as uh, unbelieving Jews, deny the scriptures because they say they taught that Christ was going to come in the first century generation and fulfill them, and he didn't do it. I heard one figure uh, that uh, where someone had researched all of the popular atheist websites that list reasons for why they reject the Bible as inspired and why they reject Jesus and the Son of God as the Son of God. One of the main reasons in all of those websites was a lack of fulfillment of Bible prophecies that had very clear, very expressed time statements attached to them, such as James 5 verse 8, the coming of the Lord is at hand. And so this, this subject as as Brother Kemp uh, demonstrates, he doesn't take it to the length that we do. We're not suggesting that. Uh, but he does stress the importance of the fall of Jerusalem and the fulfillment of prophecy in establishing faith. That's exactly right. As a matter of fact, he says um, his prophecy of the fall of Jerusalem, and I'm going to shorten this quote just a little bit. It's on page 48. His prophecy of the fall of Jerusalem in Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21, with its fulfillment in the nth degree, qualifies him as a true prophet. Well, that was the full sentence. And so the fall of Jerusalem says, yes, he is David's son, but he is also David's Lord. Secondly, he says it's pr proof of the inspiration of the New Testament. And uh, stating the inspiration of the apostles is interwoven into the accounts of both Mark and Luke. It is a record of the prophecy of the fall of Jerusalem, Mark 13, 9 through 11, and Luke 21, 13 through 15. There are many arguments to sustain the inspiration of the New Testament, but the last and final, wait a minute, the last and 
final argument is the fulfillment of Christ's prophecy of the doom of Judaism in the fall of Jerusalem. That means there cannot be another prophecy that's going to add anything to the establishment of the inspiration of the New Testament. Right. Now, we're going to, we understand that Franklin can't hold an end of time view. Exactly. And he would say that that doesn't add anything to the inspiration of Scripture because what does it matter at that point? But there are brethren who believe that prophecies have been fulfilled from the time of AD 70 up until our current time today. One of those such brethren is uh, Brother Drew Leonard, a, a man who's going to receive a whole lot of talk from us. But brother, you called us out publicly from the pulpit. There you go. And so <laughs> <laughs> he knows it's all in good faith and, and in an attempt to honestly uh, set forth the true meaning of the scriptures. And we but, have no, no ill will toward him at all. Um, I mean, we had a great time talking with him. He's a fun brother, and uh, we appreciate him. And if he's not careful... He's going to be where we are before too long. Well, it or just depends on how he, long he wants to be on the roundabout. If he is careful, actually. But uh, anyways, in the lecture on the end of time that he gave in relation to what we believe, as well as in his book, The Night Visions, he believes that the book of uh, Re Revelation, as well as Daniel 7 and Daniel 2, point to the fall of Rome. Now, Brother Camp says, however, no, no, that's not right. The final event, the final prophecy fulfilled that seals the inspiration of scriptures outside of things he sees happening at the end of time was the fall of Jerusalem. And so we have Camp versus Leonard. What street do we take? What exit number should we go down, friends? We don't know where to go, so we have to go to the scriptures. All right. Another point that he says uh, on the significance of uh, the destruction of Jerusalem, he says it closed the question of the Messiah. And he adds, if he has not come, it would be impossible to determine it since A.D. 70. And the promise of God is left hanging without ever being fulfilled. Well, what about the preaching of the gospel? Well, I mean, that just goes to show you that there's no way that you would be able to determine that since A.D. 70. But isn't there an empty tomb? <laughs> yes, there is an empty tomb, but that's not all the evidence. Well, brethren, we've been told that we place too much emphasis on A.D. 70, but it seems like some others have not put enough emphasis on that time period. That's correct, and we're not in any wise denying the impact of the cross. Not As at all. As a matter all. of fact, when you truly understand Jesus' atonement, you will understand they cannot be separated from the events. That's the, that's, this is the work of the 